وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد أما بعد سورة الطارق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسماء والطارق وما أدراك ما الطارق النجم الثاقب إن كل نفس لما عليها حافظ فلينظر الإنسان مما خلق خلق من ماء دافق يخرج من بين الصلب والترائب إنه على رجعه لقادر يوم تبل السرائر فما له من قوة ولا ناصر والسماء ذات الرجع والأرض ذات الصدع إنه لقول فصل وما هو بالهز إنهم يكيدون كيدا وأكيد كيدا فمهل الكافرين أمهلهم رويدا سورة الطارق is a surah which is مكيّة باتفاق المفسرين by consensus of the scholars of tafsir Surah Al-Tariq is from the suwar that came down before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina what does Al-Tariq mean? Al-Tariq means night comer Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala he says وَالسَّمَاءِ by the sky وَالطَّارِقِ and the night comer وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ and what can make you know O Muhammad وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ means أي وَمَا أَعْلَمَكَ what can make you know Muhammad مَا الطَّارِقَ what الطَّارِق is the night comer the night comer is أما الطَّارِق is النَّجْمُ الثَّاقِب it is the piercing star Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he starts telling us about, um, starts the surah by swearing and making an oath. And this is very common as we see in the surah which are makiyya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he swears by the universal signs. And he starts by saying, وَالسَّمَاءِ I swear by the sky. وَالطَّارِقِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's saying, I swear by the tariq. As I said, the tariq is the night comer and the scholars they said rahimahumullah jami'an there are evidences that the word at-tariq means night comer for example the hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said which al-imam al-bukhari narrated in his sahih min hadith jabir radiyallahu ta'ala anhu the prophet said idha atala ahadukum al-ghaybah if one of you is he lengthens his absence from his family meaning a man travels and he leaves his family for a long long time and he should not come to his family at night look what the prophet said he said he should not come to his family at night this hadith benefits us that if a man is absent for a long time and he has left his home 
that he shouldn't come suddenly without his wife knowing because she can be in a state where she's not prepared for him she's not ready so back in those days what they would do is that if they came to the city they wouldn't come at night so they'll go to the masjid in the morning at Fajr time so the wife would hear the news that her husband has he's come it was, this was the way to notify the wife that the husband has come so she would be ready for when he comes home to see her but what we want to take from the hadith is that the Prophet said فَلَا يطرق أَهْلَهُ لَيْلًا So the word فَلَا يطرق, as you can see is used for what? The one who ha, who moves at night. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here he says وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقِ But sometimes we find in the nusus in the hadith of the Prophet we find one particular hadith that the word طَارِق is being used for daytime and it's not used for nighttime. The one who moves about at daytime. As it's narrated from the Prophet sallallahu in which he said, "A'udhu bika, O Allah, I seek refuge in you, min tawariq al wal nahar. I seek refuge in you from what? The tawariq of day and night. So the Prophet used it for what? Night. We understand tawariq means the night comer, the one who moves around night time. But then the Prophet in that same hadith, what did he use it for? A'udhu bika, O Allah, I seek refuge in you. What? From what? Min tawariq al wal nahar. So the Prophet used the word tawariq for daytime, nahar as well. Hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah in Fathul Bari, Hafid ibn Hajar in Fathul Bari, when he explained this hadith, he said, rahimahullah, wa la yuqalu bin nahari, that the word tawariq is not used for daytime, illa majazan, except metaphorically. So if it is used for daytime, it's not literal, it's majaz. It's a metaphor. It's what? It's a metaphor. It's not made for the night daytime. It's actually specific for what? For the nighttime. Ala kulli hal, the meaning for the word tariq, according to the ulama of the language, according to the ulama of the language, is that it is referred to at nighttime. And that's what it means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Wasama'i, I swear by the sky. Wattariqi, and I swear by thee, the night comer. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ أَيْ وَمَا أَعْلَمَكَ Muhammad, what has made you know about, about the tariq? My beloved brothers and sisters, the Qur'an uses the word وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ Does anyone know how many places Allah mentions the word أَدْرَاكَ? It's 13 different places in the Qur'an. 13 different times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he uses وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ He uses it 13 times. All of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He asks a question. Meaning the word وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ means and what can make you know? And what can make you know? 13 different places the Qur'an uses it. Okay? And all of the times when Allah tells us and says to the Prophet وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ O Muhammad, what has, make, what has made you know? Allah always gives him the answer for it. Okay, Allah always tells him. For example, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Wasama'i wa tariq, wa ma adaraka ma tariq. And what makes you know Muhammad about the night comer? Then Allah tells him about it. He says, An najmu thaqib. Tariq is an najmu thaqib. Meaning Allah tells him what it is. There's one place in the Quran from those 13 different places where Allah mentions it, in which Allah says, Wa ma adaraka, and He doesn't tell him about it. Does anyone know? There's one place in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ and He doesn't tell us what it is. It's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا الْحَاقَةِ Allah doesn't tell us what it is, الحاقة. In that ayah, it doesn't explain it to us. Any place other than that, does Allah explain it to us? وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ What it is, is always told to us. Also, Allah wa Taala in three different places he he uses instead of wa ma adaraka Allah says wa ma yudrika. Three places Allah uses wa ma yudrika. The first one is in Surah Al Ahzab, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala he says wa ma yudrika laal saata takunu qariba. That's in Surah Al Ahzab, Ayah 63. In Surah Al Shura, Allah says Subhanahu wa Taala wa ma yudrika laal saata qarib. Surah Al Shura, Ayah 17. And in Surah Al Abbas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّى Those are the three places where Allah uses it as a fi'l mudari' وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ 
And all of them, Allah does not tell the Prophet directly. When the word yudirika is used, فَلَمْ يُخْبِرْهُ فِيهَا sarahah. Allah doesn't mention them to the Prophet directly when he asks him in that form. And all of that benefit was brought by none other than the noble student of uh, Al-Imam uh, Muhammad Al-Amin Al-Shanqiyatiyu, Atiyah Muhammad Salim. He has a tatimma on Adha'ul Bayan. He completes the Adha'ul Bayan and he brings those benefits from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ, وما أدراك مطارق وَمَا أَعْلَمَكَ Muhammad, what has made you know? I mean, what makes you know At-Tariq, what the night comer means? Uh, what makes you know? Then Allah says, An-Najmu Thaqib. An-Najm Thaqib here is the piercing star. What does it mean, piercing star? Both of them, Ibn Jarir, sorry, sorry, both of them, half of the Ibn Kathir mentions in his tafsir for you what it means. An-Najm Thaqib. Najm Thaqib means one of two. Piercing star. What does a piercing star mean? Meaning, the star, it pierces through the sky in shining, so we can see it on the earth. It shining pierces through the sky. So we're here on the earth, and that shining is piercing through the sky, so we can see the star shining. That's one call Ibn, Jal, Ibn Kathir brings. Ibn Kathir brings that in his tafsir. The second meaning that he brings for an najm thaqib is that the star, it pierces from one place to another, shooting through the jinns. When Allah wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala, does the shooting stars at the uh, jinn, then the stars are what? They are piercing stars. Those two qawl, Ibn Jarir, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, Hafid Ibn Kathir, he brings it in his tafsir for you. And najmu, the stars, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Al-thaqib, uh, thaqib means a piercing stars. Then Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he says, in kullu nafsin lamma alayha hafid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says to us, there is no soul, there is no individual, except that, except that he has over him or her a protector. Every single individual, kainam man kana, whoever they may be, there is a protector over that individual, looking over them. So what does it mean that there's a protector over each and every one of us? What does it actually mean? In kullu nafsin, that there is no soul on the face of this earth. Lamma alayha hafid. Before I mention what the word hafid means in the ayah, the qira'ah and the recitation of this ayah is in two, one of two ways. Okay, there's one of two ways in which it's read. In kullu nafsin, lamma bitashdeed. So you say lamma, or you don't place a shadda on there, and you say, in kullu nafsin, lama alayha hafid. And those are two qira'ah which it's recited. Allah wa ta'ala here tells us that there is no individual, there is no soul on the face of this earth except that there's a protector over them. What does that actually mean? The scholars of tafsir, they differed fima baynahum amongst themselves. One view of the scholars, they say that the protector here means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting over them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is hafid over them. That's one qawl. The second qawl says that the hafid here is the angels that are protectors over them. And then those who said that the angels are protectors over them, fima baynahum, amongst themselves, those ulama, they differed amongst themselves in two, two views. The scholars who said that the protectors are the angels, Amongst themselves, they differed in two views. Who are the protectors? I mean, sorry, what it means that the angels are the protectors over them. So we said there's two views regarding what, who the protectors are. The first one is Allah. That's one qawl of the Mufassirin. And the second qawl of the Mufassirin is that the Hafid here is the angels, not Allah. It is the angels that the ayah is talking about. Those who said that it's the angels, amongst themselves, they differed into two views. One view of them, they said that the angels are protectors over their deeds and their actions. That they're safe, they're protecting their a'mal and they are writing it in a book for them. And they use the ayah in Surah Tuqaf. مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ 
that a person does not utter a word and does not say something except that it's what? It's written by the angels. They document it, they place it in a book and a record for you and you will be shown it the day of judgment. The second, uh, state, uh, second view of those scholars who said that it's the angels, they said that the angels are not protecting the deeds. They said it means that they are protecting these individuals from any harm and any calamities. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said in Surah Al-Ra'd, Ayah 11, لَهُمْ وَعَقِبَاتٌ مِّن بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ That Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, He placed in front of them. And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala placed behind them angels يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ They are protecting them, looking after them. So they said this is what it means. Hafid ibn Kathir strengthened this opinion. Hafid ibn Kathir rahimahullah, he strengthened this opinion because he said that the ayah in Surah Al-Ra'ad clearly states the word يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ is used. As for Surah Al-Qaf, it says مَا يَلْفِظُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيمٌ عَتِيدٌ And that the word حِفْظ has not been used there. عَلَى كُلِّ حَال Both meaning are in it. Both meanings are in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in kullu nafsin that there is no soul on the face of this earth. In kullu nafsin, there is no soul. Lamma alayha hafid, except it has over it a protector. The person here needs to ponder over this point, which is that if you know that everything that you say and everything that you do, it will be written for you and it will be brought to you the day of judgment, then the aqil, the key, the smart one, the clever one, then watches what he says. The statements that you say, brothers, is one of two. It's either for you or it's what? It's against you. It's for you or it's against you. Or a statement that doesn't fall under the two. It's kalam, which is idle speech. Nor is it for you, nor is it against you. Scholars, they mention that the angels will write what's against you. And the angels will write what is for you. But will, will the angels write what isn't for or against you? The speech that people just say, that isn't necessarily bad, nor is it good. It's in the middle. Is it written? A great number of the Salaf, they said yes. Because the Ha'aya says, مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ Qawlin here is an indefinite, is a nakirah. Ma here is a nephew, which is a negation. According to the scholars of the language and according to the usuliyin, they have a principle which is, if an indefinite comes in the context of a negation, it shows generalization. If a nakirah is a fi siyaqin nafi to feed al umum, that if an if indefinite, the word qawlin here is an indefinite, it means speech. It's not a particular speech, a speech. And it's placed in the context of a negation, which is the word ma yalfidhu. They said it shows generalization. So yes, it encompasses what is for you, what is against you. And even the speech that you say, that is what? That is none, neither of the two. You're still going, it's going to be written for you. And then the matter becomes what? Even more scarier. The matter is what? Even more scarier. In kullu nafsin, there is not a, a soul, lamma alayha hafid, except that there are over them a protector. Then Allah says, فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ So let mankind, let human beings do what? فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ So let mankind observe, analyze, look at مِمَّا خُلِقْ From what he was created. O human, look what Allah created you from subhanahu wa ta'ala. خُلِقَ You have been created. And Allah created you from subhanahu wa ta'ala. From what? مِنْ مَاءٍ you were created from fluid, which is dafiqin, which it ejected. The word dafiq is when something jumps and it's not, it doesn't come out flowing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, فَلْيَنْظُرِ insan, Let mankind look at. Some of the ulama, they said, فَلْيَنْظُرِ insan. Here this al-insan is ahdiyya. 
In other words, it means the human. And it's not talking about all of human beings. It's specific to the kuffar. So some of the mufassirin, they said because of the alif and lam that's in it, it's talking about the humans, meaning the ones who rejected. They rejected what? They rejected the resurrection. They rejected that after they die and their body perishes, that Allah will create them again or bring them back to their original form and bring them the day of judgment. The ones who rejected it, it's those the ones Allah is speaking to in this ayah. Some of the mufassirin, they said, فَلْيَنْظُرِ insanu That the word insan here is al-kafir, not to the believers. Some of the scholars, they said that. And that is a call Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, rahimahullah. If I'm not wrong, it's a call in which he strengthened uh, rahimahullah. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, it's a call I think in which he strengthened alayhi rahmatullah. فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ Let mankind or let the second goal is that it means all of mankind. Let them look at مِمَّا خُلِقَ What they were created from. Observe what Allah created you from. So we can take both views. It wouldn't be a problem. That Allah is talking to the kafir from the angle of look at what you're created from now. The one who created you from what you are now. Would it be a struggle for him to put you back to what you are? Because, brothers, is it hard, and nothing is hard to Allah, but is it hard to initiate something, or is it hard to bring back something to how it was? It's harder to initiate something, to start something. But to do something as it was done is not a hard thing. So look how you are now. The one who made you the way that you are now, is he not able to bring you back to that exact same form? Why would he be able to? As Allah said in the Quran, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقَ the one who created you, who initiated you, who started your creation the way that you are, is going to take you back to how you are, and that is more easier for him. Ah, this is easier than. The second one is that that's what if the ayah is talking to the kuffar, and that's why it's telling the kafir to look at yourself. But if the ayah we say is talking to everybody and it's talking to the believers. Allah is talking to the believers from the angle of what? فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ مِمَّا خُلِقُ Oh man, can look at what you're created from? Look at what your essence are. Do you think you deserve to be arrogant? Do you think you should be somebody who thinks high of himself? When all you're made out of is what? خُلِقَ مِمَّا إِنْ دافق. You're created from fluid that came out from the mother and the husband. This is what you're from. خُلِقَ Anyone who's inshallah ta'ala blocking cars, bi'idhnillah al kareem please brothers, if you know that you're blocking somebody, some people don't want to stay, so just move your car out of the way. If your car is blocking anyone, there's no need for plate numbers to be said. You know, after you pray your salah, just go downstairs, move your car. Place it outside or place it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So the ayah, when it's talking to the believers, it's talking to them from the angle of what? فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ مِمَّا خُلِقُ Look at what you're created from and what Allah made you out of. Do you think after knowing what your essence is, do you think you should be arrogant? Do you should, be, should you be one who is full of himself? فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ So let mankind observe مِمَّا خُلِقُ From what he was created. خُلِقَ Mankind was created from. مِنْ مَاءٍ He was created from fluid. That fluid is what? Da fiqin that ejected uh, that ejected and came out from the wife and the husband came from both of them. Now Allah tells us where this ma the ma which is da fiq where did it come out from where did it initiate from Allah subhanahu wa taala He says ya khuruju this water I mean, this fluid ya khuruju ay ya khuruju hada al ma this fluid it comes out min bain al sulbi وَالتَّرَائِدِ It comes out from between the backbone and the rib. The word التَّرَائِب It means the qilada. The woman when she wears her necklace. The necklace, where does it come to? Where it comes to, that's, where the, that's exactly where it is. That is where, that's what's meant by التَّرَائِب. The woman when she wears her necklace on her neck. Huh? 
where the bottom part reaches. That part is what is known as the taraib. It is the part when the woman puts her qilada, which is her necklace on, where it comes to, which is her chest. This is what's meant by it. يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ The ma, the fluid. Where does it come from? It comes from يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ In between the backbone and the taraib. This is where it comes out from. Well, like when we ponder on these verses, brothers, we learn a principle. A, va- a very strong principle which is the Quran is teaching us that a person's virtue is not connected to their essence. Okay? Because if we really look at your essence, everybody's the same. لا فضل لعربي على أعجمي That an Arab does not have virtue on a non-Arab. A black does not have virtue over a white, nor does a white have a virtue over a black. But the people, ya ikhwah, their honor and their virtue is based upon what? It's not based upon their essence. Because look how Allah puts the essence down. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does he say? خُلِقَ مِنْ مَاءٍ دَافِقٍ يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالتَّرَائِبِ This is what you're made from. Ah. This is what you are made from. This ma'u dafiq if it goes on your clothes, you want to wash it off. That's what you're made from. That's what you came from. And then the sharaf, the honor of a person, is not connected to their essence and the country that they're from or the people that they're from or the nation that they're from your essence isn't connected to your, your virtue is not connected to that your virtue my beloved brothers and sisters is connected to your deeds that's what Allah wa ta'ala he says inna akramakum indallahi the greatest amongst you in the eyes of Allah is what? atqakum the one who is most pious the one who is what? the most pious ولذلك the famous hadith of the Prophet what did he say? وَمَنْ بَطَعَ بِهِ عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ وَمَنْ بَطَعَ بِهِ عَمَلُهُ Anyone whose actions delay him لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ Your lineage is not going to bring you forward. The Prophet said this عليه الصلاة والسلام So if you're from a good background and you're from a rich family or you're from a nation that's up there that will not bring you forward the day of judgment. What will bring you forward is what? Your amal and your righteous deeds. Your amal and your righteous deeds. You look at what? Abu Lahab, who is the Prophet's uncle. His dad's brother. He's in the hellfire. Who is it? Bilal, and Salman al-Farisi, and Suhaib al-Rumi, who are non-Arabs, all of them. They are what? They are noble companions of the Prophet So what is it that brought these forward and gave them a virtue and made their names remembered and whenever we say their names, Bilal radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. When we say Salman al-Farisi, we say radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. When we say Suhaib al-Rumi, we say radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. And when we talk about Abu Lahab, we speak about him about in what way? As mentioning that he's in the hellfire, and that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala cursed him. And we read Quran, ila, ila an yarithallahu al-ardh wa man alayha, until the day of judgment, tabbat yada abi lahab wa tab, ma aghna anhu ma wa ma kasab. All of that is being read. And this is the Prophet's uncle, his dad's brother. Lineage didn't help him. What helped was deeds. And that didn't work for Abu Lahab. So what worked for Salman al-Farisi and Bilal is righteous deeds. يَخْرُجُ The fluid emerging مِنْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالتَّرَائِبِ Emerging from between the backbone and the rib. يَخْرُجُ هَذَا الْمَاء This water comes out from what? الصُّلْبِ Which is the backbone. والتراب and the rib. then Allah سبحانه وتعالى he says Allah سبحانه وتعالى he says إنه Allah سبحانه وتعالى على رجعه لقادر Allah سبحانه وتعالى is one who is able Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the one who is able أما إنه Allah على رجعه to return him the human being to life again laqadirun is able allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to put life back to somebody after they've died he is able and he has the strength for that subhanahu wa ta'ala yawma some people will incorrectly say this that they will say the yawma is muta'alliqun it's connected to laqadirun because that was the last wa akhirul madkuraini it was the last mentioned thing but no yawma here is connected to a raj'ihi. A yawma 
the day which Allah will return them. Don't say the day which Allah has the ability. No, don't say that. Because Laqadir is mentioned, and it was the last thing that was mentioned. So don't connect the Yawmah to that. And say the day which Allah is able. Say, Yawmah Tubla Sara'ir. Yawmah, the day which Allah will bring them back, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That day, what will happen? Tubla Sara'ir. That day, the secrets will be brought forward. And every single thing will be seen. Everything will be brought out in the open. Innahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala raj'ihi bringing back every single one of us to life after we have died laqadirun he has the ability subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has the strength subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that it's nothing too hard for him it's rather an easy matter as i said to you wa huwa alladhi yabda'u al-khalqa thumma yu'iduhu wa huwa ahwanu alayh this is a matter which is very easy for allah the matter is what kun bi fayakunu the matter will be all he has to say is kun bi fayakun will be a man from the previous nations that the Prophet told us. He went to his children and then he said to his children, When I die, burn me. And when I when you burn me, burn my body. When you burn me, I become ashes. He said, Take my ashes, the ashes that my body becomes. Take it to different directions on a windy day. And then blow it into the air, throw it into the air. Because if Allah gets the ability to bring me back together, Allah will punish me. Allah will punish me, a punishment in which He doesn't punish anybody. He's going to severely punish me. So take my body, spread it all out, scatter it in the earth. Two of you shouldn't be the same. All of you go all over the places and do it on a windy day. So when He, when they, when he died, his kid did that, they took his body and they scattered it on the earth on a windy day and then they walked away from it. Then Allah wa ta'ala, all he said was what? Kun bi fayakun. It became, his whole body just came together. And then he was brought to Allah wa ta'ala. The Prophet told us this. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, what is it that made you do what you did? Why did you do this? Why did you take? Why did you make your children do this for you? And he said, Oh Allah, I was scared of you. I knew that if I come to you, you'll destroy me. And then Allah wa ta'ala, he said, Go and enter Jannah. Go and what? Enter Jannah. So this hadith teaches us the quwa and the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the strength that he has. However much a person tries to run away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there isn't. You hear today, that a person goes to a courtroom and when they go to the courtroom they've done a crime they've committed that crime it's they will even admit if they, they, they committed the crime okay and what will happen they will go to the, they'll get a nice lawyer and they might walk out of that courtroom without no charges and they're free and every single body knows that they did the, that they did the crime ah some of them, subhanAllah, they, com they admitted that they did the crime on Instagram. <laughs> and the Instagram, they admitted it. They went to court and they walked out free. Ah. They walked out free. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya ikhwah. The matter is not like that. To him, he knows it before you even do it. He even knows the sins that you haven't done. If you were to do it, how you would do it. That's his knowledge, that's his ability, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then... Your fear and your worry and your concern should increase. Innahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala raj'ihi In returning everybody to life laqadirun He is able to do that. The day yawma tubla The day which Allah will return them subhanahu wa ta'ala What will happen? Tubla sara'ir Secrets will be brought forward. The secrets will be made public. That day what was in the hearts and what people were hiding, it's all going to be made public. Nothing is hidden. You was considering a private matter. Now everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He chooses to make it public. He chooses to make it, He chooses to make it, subhanahu wa ta'ala, public. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari says the following, Yawma tubla sara'ir He says that they which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He brings out the secrets. He says, فَيُظْهِرُ مِنْهَا فَيَظْهَرُ مِنْهَا يَوْمَئِذٍ مَا كَانَ فِي الدُّنْيَا مُسْتَخْفِيًا 
that which when we were in the earth that was hidden that day it becomes open in the public and ayun al ibad in the eyes of the people matters become clear min al faraid allati kana allah alzamahu iyaha the obligatory things which allah told you to do did you do it with sincerity did you do it for him alone or was there in your heart another motive and another in, another thing in your heart who were you really doing it for that day will be the day which everything is brought out sometimes a person does a deed that particular moment when they're doing that righteous deed they're doing it for allah's sake they only wanted it for allah's face they woke up woke up at night and they prayed no one else knew they were praying and they did it for allah's sake but then in the morning somehow shaitan comes and whispers to them so they want to somehow tell the people that they were that they were awake they've already done it for allah's sake but now they feel the need to tell the people that they were awake last night so they say subhanallah last night who who, who felt the earthquake ah uh, who felt the earthquake and everybody's like no i didn't i was sleeping so, subhanallah i was awake in alone i was in sujood ah uh, i was in what i was in sujood so he's done the righteous deed the night before he wasn't doing it for anybody other than allah he only did it for him but the next day he he comes out and he says things so the people know what he was up to last night all of that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring out in the open and he will make every single body see it but there are khawas elite individuals allah will push them, pull them to the side and he will say to them ya abdi my slave do you know you did these sins and he will say oh allah i know allah will say then to him satartu halaka fi dunya when you were in the earth i hid these sins for you no one knew when you were up to all of this everybody thought you were noble righteous a righteous slave of mine used to used to be like that but behind closed door i know what you were i know what you were up to and you now know that this is what you were doing and i say oh wallah i do know allah says i made sure no one found out in the dunya i hid it for you and he says oh wallah i know you did allah then says to him wa ana asturuha lak alyawm today i'm also going to hide it for you no one's going to find out this is going to be between me and you and that slave that day will be so happy that his secrets his wrong doings his crimes but the scholars like ibn al-qayyim in his kitab al-da'wa al-dawa mentions why allah would do it for somebody like that ya ikhwah the reason a person will get that is because when they were doing a sin like that they had nadam regret and they were a person when they did the sin they will always feel hurt in their heart and they will be crying about it and they will be nervous and they will say i'm not going to do it again allahumma ighfir li oh allah forgive me and then he falls into it again and he's in that consistent battle he's in that consistent battle and he dies in that way it's not a slave who gave in to doing things privately and just la- laughs about it and enjoys himself and even make, makes that sin part of his schedule or oh, i need to get home early so i can do the sin or i got no it's talking about a slave who knew what he was doing was wrong try to place every obstacle in front of himself not to do it but because his nafs was weak and his soul was very weak he kept falling into the sin that's the slave that allah is going to hide it for ibn al-qayyim says that's the slave that allah is going to hide it for as for the other slave he's sin the one who's enjoying the private sins that he's doing there's a hadith of hadith thawban in mu'jam at-tabarani that allah will bring that person the day of judgment and allah will make all of his righteous deed what haba am mantura Allah will nullify all of his good doings and everything that he said and everything that he was up to Allah will nullify it all subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sahaba they said ya rasul Allah are these people not believers why Allah is why is Allah going to nullify all their righteous deeds what was their reason and Allah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said no they were a people who used to pray they used to fast they used to come with righteous deeds they even used to pray qiyamul layl walakinnahum idha khalaw bi maharim Allah intahakuha the problem with these people is when the doors closed when the lights switched off they something would come to their mind something would they would pop into their head and they would just listen to the music they would listen to the song they would watch movies all of them all of these things walakinnahum idha khalaw bi maharim Allah intahakuha when they are private and alone they do the sins those ones is not the ones who Allah is going to say to them the day of judgment my slaves you did something privately i hid it for you and now i'm going to hide it for you no that slave who did it was enjoying it and now 
It's sad because a lot of our youngsters, they do sins, they do wrong, and they come out in the morning, and Allah was hiding it for you. The Prophet said in the hadith, Kullu ummati mu'afa. All of my ummah is forgiven, illa al-mujahireen. Except those who come out and speak about their sins. He did a sin last night. The hadith mentions that he did a sin last night. Allah concealed it for him. Allah hid it for him. So what does he do? He comes out in the morning and he says, Akhi, subhanallah. You know that girl that I was talking to? Naam. And he talks about it. And Allah hid it for you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one knew of it, but you start to boast and speak about it. The Prophet told us, those people are not forgiven. They are not forgiven. Everyone else is forgiven. Kullu ummati, kum, kullu ummati. All of my ummah is forgiven except those ones. The one who comes out after Allah concealed your sins, you're coming out and you're speaking about it. You know why somebody would do that? You know why somebody would speak about their sins that they did? It's because they have no shame. The veneration and the glorification of Allah in your eyes is gone. You don't respect Him nor are you shy of Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Bakr, it was said that radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he would go out to do a shower, Abu Bakr, Siddiq Hadil Ummah, if he would go out to do a shower, my beloved brothers and sisters, he wouldn't do it standing up. Abu Bakr wouldn't. He would go down and he would shower, hiding his private part. Haya min Allah, because he was very shy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the shower. That is the what? Shower. An action that's permissible for him. Abu Bakr chose not to do it in that way. Why? Because he was shy of Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our mother, Aisha, she was what? She was in her house. She was in her house. Her husband, Nabiullah Muhammad, got buried in, house, in the house. Then, who got buried in the house after that? Abu Bakr got buried in the house. And then who got buried after that? Umar. The minute Umar got buried in the house, Aisha started wearing her hijab. Start covering up. Umar is not in her room. Umar is buried. Haya min Allah. Shyness of Allah. And I think today, was it today? Or some time close? They got what's called Women's Day, huh? Huh? Was it yesterday? And our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, what did she do? She covered herself. She what? She covered her beauty and kept it private. Knowing that Umar can't see her. And Umar, but this is the this is the type of people the Prophet nurtured, alayhi salatu wasalam. These are the people who came up from the Madrasatun Nabawiyyah, the Prophet school. This is the people the Prophet Sallallahu who graduated from his madrasa. This is the jeel, this is the generation he brought out, alayhi salatu wasalam, who took the religion not just openly, like in qalban wa qaliban. Internally, the religion was everything to them. And externally, the religion was what? It was everything to them. Wallahi, the hadith, you all know it, majority of you. The hadith, when the ayah came down regarding the hijab, the ayah what? The ayah to hijab, when it came down, Ya Nabi Qulli Azwajika wa Manatika wa Nisa'il Mu'minina Yudinina Alayhina min Jalabimihna. Aisha, what did she say? She said, Rahim Allahu Nisa'il Ansar. May Allah have mercy upon the women of Ansar. When this ayah came down, what did they do? Shakkakna murutahunna. They ripped their cloths and they started to wear it. Even the woman who didn't have clothes, she went and borrowed clothes. She, she went and she borrowed clothes from another woman to cover herself up. Allahu Akbar. And then we want 1,400 something years later to enter Jannah with these people. And we want to have a place, a close station to them. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Ya ikhwa, the, the matter is that there's going to come a day. Yawma malin, a day. Tubla sarair, a day when. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring out the secrets, the things that were hidden, Allah is going to bring them. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Famalahu that day, Famalahu min quwwatin wa la nasir. That day man will not have no power or any helper. That day the kafir, the disbeliever, the wrongdoer, and even the believer who is a criminal, who sinned, if Allah wants to destroy you. And Allah wants to punish him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't have what? فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ قُوَّةِ You have no strength. You have no power to retaliate and fight against Allah. وَلَا نَاصِرٍ And that day, you won't have anyone helping you. The people who are today deceiving you, brothers, who are making you do the sins that you're doing, 
the people who are making you do, st stand in the corners, the one who's making you stab and kill your innocent brothers and Muslim brothers of yours, or whether they aren't even Muslim, but making you commit these crimes and steal and sell these drugs and drink the alcohol that you're drinking and making the sisters take their hijab off, that individual is not going to help you the day of judgment. You have no strength. And you have no external help. Because the human, what does it need, brothers? It needs quwa. Some people, they don't need nobody to help them. They have their own strength. They're capable of doing it. They can do their own thing. Allah says to you, you don't have that. So you can't help yourself. You have no external force. No one can come in your support. None of that. So what are you? You're a weak individual who only has Allah. And if you disobey Him that day, and you don't go back to His commands, if you don't stay away from these prohibitions, the strength is not going to help you. And that individual who's now trying to tell you that, don't worry, I'm your boy, I'm with you. Wallahi, he's not going to help you the day of judgment. Rather, Allah tells us, The ones who are now throwing you into the wrong, that day, they are the first to free themselves from you. They're going to say to you, I've got nothing to do with you. Me? I don't remember you. Leave me alone. The shaytan that's deceiving you. Allah Ta'ala says uh, about the shaytan, When Allah tells us here, that the shaytan will also free himself from you. He so I've got nothing to do with you. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي Don't blame me. وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Blame yourselves. Uh, I can't do anything for you. Iblis is going to give a khutbah that day to all the people misguided. So I've got nothing to do for you. I'm going to the hell for myself. I can't help you, nor can you help me. Don't blame me, I won't blame you. So that day, you've been, you're in a state of loss. There's no one to help you. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَاللَّهِ سُوَى يَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لِتَّرِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا يَا وَيْلَتَ لَيْتَرِ اتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا لَقَدْ أَضَلَّنِي عَلِي ذِكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَعَلِي وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانُ خَلُولًا That person you're with is going to free himself from you. And you're going to regret that day when it comes to you. Observe your situation now. فَمَا لَهُ It is not for mankind that day. مِن قُوَّةٍ You have no strength that day. وَلَا نَاصِرٍ You have no one giving you victory that day. No one's going to give you help. No one's going to support you. Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you follow him and you follow his commands. Then Allah tabarak wa ta'ala he says, وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الرَّجْعِ By the sky which which Some of the Mufassirin they differ on what is meant by it. But وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الرَّجْعِ The word رَجْعِ means, and the strongest of those قول is, is that it means يَرْجِعُ مِنْهَا الْمَطَرُ مَرَّةً بَعْدَ مَرَّةً The rain keeps coming from it. So Allah is swearing by the what? وَالسَّمَاءِ The sky ذَاتِ الرَّجْعِ That holds the rain. What does it do? It holds the rain and then it lets it go. And then it holds it again. And every time not, these clouds are just sending down rain. They, they're what? They're sending down rain. Allah is saying, I swear by that. وَالْأَرْضِ And I swear by the earth ذَاتِ الصَّدْعِ The earth which which cracks open. This earth, when the rain comes down on it, what does it do? In order for the, uh, the plants and the seeds to come out, it cracks open slightly. Uh, Allah said, I swear by that earth. Innahu, verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Indeed, Innahu, ay the Qur'an, laqawlun faslun. This Qur'an is a what? Is a decisive statement. Innahu laqawlun fasl. That this Qur'an, يُفَرِّقُ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْحَقِّ وَالْبَاطِلِ The job of the Qur'an is that it distinguishes falsehood from the truth. The job of the Qur'an and the thing that the Qur'an does is that to its what? It decides what is right from what is wrong. It distinguishes what is right from what is wrong. إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ الْفَصْلِ And then anybody who's holding on to the Qur'an, any da'i who's calling to the path of Allah, his job has to be the same. He has to distinguish between what? False from the truth. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, in the battle of Badr when it took place, what did Allah say after that? لِيَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ That the, true, the good one and the evil one are distinguished. 
In another ayah, what did Allah say? لِيَحْلِكَ مَنْ هَلَكَ عَنْ بَيِّنَا وَيَحْيَا مَنْ حَيَّ عَنْ بَيِّنَا That the one who's going to live in good is going to live in good. And the one who's going to live upon falsehood, he knows that he's upon falsehood. The Quran clarified everything. In another ayah, Allah says, قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُقَا That the, the truth has come, which is that the Quran has come. And the Quran, when it comes, it brings about the truth. And when it brings about the truth, the truth, when it comes, the falsehood cannot stay no longer. So it perishes, it weakens. Okay, it weakens. So the Quran's job is to distinguish the falsehood from the truth. A da'i, a person who's calling to the path of Allah, what does he do? He distinguishes falsehood from the truth. He doesn't allow them both to be mixed together. And doesn't say, no problem, let them just be together. His job is that he makes one clear from the other. The falsehood are three. Kufr, bid'ah, and ma'asi. The first one is kufr, disbelief. Second one is what? Bid'ah. Third one is what? Ma'asi, sins. The Quran, it told, it tries to put those clear to the people and tell them what they are. And it wants to call them to the truth and propagate the truth and make them come with the truth, which is what? At-Tawheed, was-Sunnah, wa ta'ah. Tawheed, to worship Allah alone. As-Sunnah, to follow the Prophet's way. Atta'a is to stay away from sins that come with obedience. These are the three, wa alaykum as These are the three in which the Quran wants to propagate and the truth in which it wants to call to. Innahu, verily the Quran is what? Laqawlun faslun. Indeed, that the Quran is a decisive statement. And then Allah says, Wama huwa bil hazli. And it is not amusement. The Quran is not what? It is not la'ib. And it is not lahu. Min al qawl. It's not statements which are amusement. Wow. As some people do. They come to the tafsir class. They hear a story. Ashab al buruj. Qissat ashab al khudud. And they listen to it. And say, wow, this took place, huh? And they walk away. Just as though it's an amazing story, faqat. But no, the Quran is not like that. The Quran has come for you to take it on board, to live by it, to make it change your life. Wa innahu. Indeed, the Quran is a decisive statement. And it is not the Quran. And it is not amusement. It is not la'iban. Nor is it lahu. It's rather a qawl which is haq. Then Allah says, Indeed, they, the disbelievers, The disbelievers, they are planning a plan. They are plotting and they are planning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? He is, Allah is saying, وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدًا And I am planning a plan. There are three words in the Quran that come. And some people they say, when they want to neg uh, refute Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah when it comes to the attributes of Allah, they say, the word Kaid, the word Kaid, they say that you guys don't affirm that for Allah. Kaid means to in the Arabic language, is to, uh, according to them, what the way they perceive it is that you deceptive, you're deceptive towards somebody, and you're treacherous towards that individual, and deceptive towards them. They said when it comes to that, you never, uh, you never uh, affirm this for Allah subhanahu wa taala, because Allah uses three uh, times in the Quran. He uses, he uses, he uses the word kaid, and he also uses the word khida. And the third one which Allah uses is what? Makr. Those three. All three of them, brothers, let me explain what they mean. The word kaid is actually to do something to somebody when they are not expecting it. That's what the word kaid means. You have to remember that. That somebody does something to somebody when they are not a they're not they're not aware of it. The word Kaid can be madhmum and it can be mamduh. It can be blameworthy and it can be praiseworthy. Okay, brothers? It is blameworthy and it is evil when the person does somebody to some, some he does something to someone when they are not expecting it and the person didn't do anything to you. Are we all together? This is evil. That's the one that the kuffar are trying to do. That's the one Allah is saying, Innahum yakiduna kaida. They are trying in their own mind, they want to hurt the believers when they're least expecting or when they're unaware of it. Does that make sense? But then when Allah says, وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدًا means Allah, the second type, which is praiseworthy, is to harm someone when they are not expecting it 
from the angle of retaliation. This is praiseworthy. Are we all together? Uh, does that make sense? Allah is taking back his rights for the believers. So the word kaid means two meanings. Um, it's one meaning which means to do something to somebody when they are not expecting it and they are unaware of it. But it can be done evilly, ever, evilly or it can, be, it can be done in a devilish way or it can be done in a permitted, justified, praiseworthy way. When it's devilish and it's blameworthy is that when the person does it, when the person didn't do anything to you, and you plot against them, and they are not expecting it from you, this time is called Kaid, which is Madmum, it's the one Allah is affirming for them. But when Allah does it, is when they are not aware of it. He's doing it to them, because they were the ones who did it to the believers. So the question here is, how does Allah plan against them when they are not expecting it? The Mufassirin, they said, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does it, is that He allows them to increase in evil. And He makes them do the evil that they are doing. And they think to themselves, so they do a sin. And they say, wow, I didn't get punished, subhanAllah. Rather, I got more money. I did something wrong and I got away with it. And so the person starts to think to himself, you know what? Me actually doing this sin is there's no problem with it. As Allah said in the ayah, سَنَسْتَدْرِجُهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ وَأُمْلِي لَهُمْ إِنَّ كَيْدِ مَتِينَ Allah lets you do that. Years go by, you keep doing it, keep doing it. You keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep doing it. And then one day you get grabbed. Umar radiallahu anhu grabbed a man. And when he grabbed a man who stole, Umar said to him, Ayyah. The man cried, he said, Wallahi, Umar, this was the first time I did it. Umar said, Kadhabta, you lied. Allah never grabs a person on their first attempt. Allah never exposes you on the first time. The reason why you got caught this time is because it wasn't the first time. The Mukhalif for the Sunan Illa. It goes against Allah's Sunnah and the way Allah does things. But a lot of people say when they get caught, oh, this was my first time. No, this was the first time you got caught. This was the first time you got caught. It's not the first time you did it. It was not the first time necessarily you did it. Because when a person does something, they get caught. Is after they've been doing it for a while. They became used to it. And they put their guards down. Allah says, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِحُوا بِمَا أُوتُوا أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بَغْتَى فَإِذَا مُبْلِسُونَ Ah, they will play, they will do sin. First time the person does a sin, the body and the mind does a, is a, the person is weary, very nervous. So the person keeps doing it. The body puts his guard down and then that's when he gets caught. That's when he gets, that's when he gets caught. So Allah wa ta'ala, that's what he does. And when Allah grabs them, Look what Allah said in the ayah. وَكَذَلِكَ أَخْذُ رَبِّكَ إِذَا أَخَذَ الْقُرَى وَهِيَ ظَالِمَةً إِنَّ أَخْذَهُ أَلِيمٌ شَدِيدٌ Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala is what? The village does a sin. They commit crime. Allah will let them do it for a while. Once they reaches the level that Allah wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala, بَلَغَ السَّيْلُ الزُّبَى When it reaches Zuba, huh? that's what we Somalians say, past Alam Tala. كَيْفَ فَعَلَى رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ When it passes that level, what do we do? Allah will grab you. That time when He grabs you, there's no letting go. It's too late now. You had that chance to come to your senses. That's the way Allah wa Taala plans against them. And that's the way Allah wa Taala He destroys them subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدًا Then Allah says finally the last ayah فَمَهِّلِ الْكَافِرِينَ أَمْهِلْهُمْ رُوَيْدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says to the Prophet and the believers so allow time for the disbelievers. So allow time for the disbelievers. Leave them for a while. Allah says, فَمَهِّلِ الْكَافِرِينَ Let the disbelievers be. Allow them time. Imhal is when you give, somebody says to you, you know, wait for me. Give me a little bit of time. Allah says, فَمَهِّلِ الْكَافِرِينَ Allow a while for the disbelievers. أَمْهِلْهُمْ رُوَيْدًا Allah says, leave them for a while. This ayah, the Mufassirin, they mentioned that this was before the jihad was made obligatory. Before the jihad was made obligatory, the, Allah told the believers, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ قِيلَ لَهُمْ كُفُوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَتُوا الزَّكَاةَ That's what the believers were told. كُفُوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ means what? Put your hands behind your backs. 
Don't do nothing. Don't kill anybody. Just pray your salah. Just fast. That's what they were told in Mecca. They were told that wasfah anhum, waqul salam. Turn away from them. Forgive them. Don't say anything to them. That's what was the Meccan period. That was what? That was the Meccan period. Allah says, فَمَهِلِ الْكَافِرِينَ أَمْهِلْ هُمْ رُوَيْدًا Let them be. Don't touch them. But then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the believers to Medina and they got strength and a government, they were not going to take the oppression anymore. They were not going to take it. Nor were they going to accept anyone to do what they want to them. This is when Allah says, Allah has now permitted for you. Allah has allowed for you, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to what? To go and destroy these enemies who are fighting against you. Retaliate, respond to them. That's why in the other ayah, Allah says, وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُ بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They were planning to kill the Bliya Sahabas. So they were told, leave them alone. Don't touch them. This the scholars say, it was the hikmah and the wisdom of how the Quran came down. Is that the person looks at their ability and their strength. That when you have the quwa and you have the strength and the ability, you fight with the enemies. And if you haven't got the quwa and you don't have the strength, then you follow the ayat of what? Meccan period. And Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah is the one who mentioned this in his kitab Min Hajj al-Sunnah Nabawiyyah. That if the believers don't have the quwa and they don't have the strength, they don't fight until they gain that strength and they work towards that and they respond if they are oppressed anything which I have said that was wrong is from me and shaitan and Allah and his messenger are free from it subhanakallahumma bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illallah astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi